All right. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to lecture ten of uh, mathematical methods. Now, I realize that group theory has gone on for a bit longer than anticipated. Uh, at least, all of this discussion about uh, irreducible representations and so on and so forth, conjugacy classes, character tables. Uh, but these are absolute essentials of group theory, and if you don't know these, then well, uh, you don't really know much about group theory in that way. So, in any case, uh, today I'm going to be wrapping up uh, this uh, this part of the uh, this segment of our our course, and uh, with a description of uh, a couple of different applications of all of these concepts. Okay, so uh, before I do that, just let me uh, quickly go over all of the different um, essential concepts that one should know right, regarding uh, groups and their representation. So, okay, so Right, so the first obviously is what is a group? Now, that I presume all of you understand, but at this stage, what are the different kinds of groups? Abelian, non abelian. Uh, uh, then finite, infinite, etc. Then, uh, if you have two two groups, you have the notion of uh, group homomorphism. which uh, tells you uh, how to map. So group, homo group homomorphism is a map from one group to another, which maintains the, preserves the group multiplication property. And if the map is one to one, uh, then it becomes a, uh, an isomorphism. Uh, uh, then we have the notion of a subgroup so a subgroup of a group, as the word, as the name suggests, is a subset uh, which satisfies uh, all the group axioms. So it is, it is a subset of a group, which is itself a group. Then we have uh, uh, a few different kinds of groups uh, which are important. Uh, we have matrix groups. Right? What are these groups? These are, for example, SO2, SO3, SON, right? So this stands for special orthogonal. Then you can also have special unitary. Uh, then you can have a special linear. And uh, the notation is, is of this type. So this 
says that it's an n by n group, n by n matrix, which has real elements or an n by n matrix, which has complex elements. That's what this notation tells us. And it's, uh, it's a linear group. So you don't, uh, that means we are not placing any restriction on of orthogonality or unitarity on the element, but special that means the determinant of the groups is one. Okay. Uh, then for finite groups, of course, and these groups are, these matrix groups are, are infinite. Uh, then you have uh, some, some other finite groups which are important. One is the permutation group. Which is written as Fn, right? So this is the uh, this is the group of permutations of n elements. of an element, right? And um, see, then we have, for instance, uh, the examples of the group of integers. Uh, what else? Uh, integers with the addition as the multiplication law or uh, real numbers with uh, the multiplication law being the normal usual multiplication. And then another very important group is uh, what is written as, and so this is Z, this is R. Other very important group is Zn. This is the group of integers uh, with addition mod n. So for example, if you have <coughs> Z3, uh, it will consist of uh, three elements zero, one, two uh, with addition mod three as your group multiplication property. Then for, for groups, you have uh, various, pro various properties which, are, which characterize the group, for instance, the order of a group. So the order of a group is uh, the number of elements. It's the, it's the cardinality or the size of the group. Of course, for the for infinite <clears throat> for the group of integers or real numbers or for matrix groups, uh, the order is <clears throat> order is infinite. Uh, but there are other uh, Related properties uh, of those groups, which you can which you can identify, which are something which is known as a volume. So even though the whole group is 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 has an infinite number of elements, you can still define um, a sense in which a certain amount of elements uh, occupy a certain volume. But anyway, that is not something we'll be worried about. Then we have the concept of a conjugacy class. So a conjugacy class, as I've explained, <coughs> is the set of elements uh, which satisfy an equivalence relation equivalent under conjugation by some other third group element. Right. Um, so, and a conjugacy. This 
this partitions every group every discrete group into disjoint subset okay so disjoint is because none of the if if an element is in one conjugacy class it is it cannot be in another in a different conjugacy class um <clears throat> and then there are a couple of other aspects which i didn't uh, mention um, but which are important so i'll just uh, mention the names briefly there's a notion of a, of a coset uh, then normal subgroup and then quotient group or the quotient uh, the quotient group so these uh, you can you can read up about if you are interested in these are also very important concepts uh, and uh, they are related to the concept of uh, this thing of a conjugacy class and one more concept which is the which is called the center of a group uh then uh there is the notion of uh of a direct product of a group of two groups so you can take two groups and you can take a direct product of groups to give you another group and we have seen an example of this in 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 the previous uh, lecture uh or the one before that where i gave you i was talking the about the example of two spin half particle and uh, i a showed you that um on either spin one half particle you have a representation of of su2 which acts so on both of those particles on the combined system you have a representation which looks like which has this form uh, this is this is an example of uh, well this is an example of a rep direct product of a representation uh, you can also construct similarly a direct product of of a, of two groups so those do those two groups don't have to be the same as an example let me just mention because for instance in the standard model of particle physics you will often see this kind of a notation uh you will su3 cross u1 you will often see this kind of notation which says that the group of the standard model can be written as su3 cross times su2 l times su1 so what is this this is a this is a group which is formed by taking a direct product of of these uh, individual groups um then we come to the group representations so what is a what is a what is the representation of a group it is a vector space so the representation of a group g consists of a vector space v and a map from g to the set of op linear operators on v uh which satisfies the group multiplication property of the group axioms so that means for all elements of the group 
for each element uh, this map gives you a matrix this map phi of g gives you an n by n matrix where n is the dimension of the vector space that we are acting on and so this means that you can have many different representations of a group uh, but those representations uh, and those representations can have different dimensionalities and then uh, when we are on the topic of representations we have the concept of equivalent representation so two different representations are equivalent if you can relate them via a similarity transformation so if you have two representations of a group let's say d1 and d2 and there exists some uh, matrix s such that uh, the elements of one group can be written as in this form this implies that the two representations are equivalent and uh, this brings us to the concept of a character of a of a group or the character of a group element in a given in a given representation in a given representation mu of g so if you have some representation mu and you have the representation matrix then the character of the group element is simply the trace of this of this matrix the character has certain properties which is that it is is the same uh is invariant under similarity transformations so if you have two equivalent representations uh the character does not change uh the character of the identity element of in is equal to the dimension of the given representation okay and uh, characters are invariant under under group conjugacy invariant under conjugation so this is it's important to remember keep in mind that uh, this group conjugation is distinct from the similarity transformation which acts so uh, this similarity transformation acts at the level of a representation whereas group conjugation acts at the level of a group so these are two distinct uh but they are related but they are distinct okay so important to keep that in mind then we have the concept of reducible and irreducible representations so if you have some representation d of g and it can be written as a sum of over uh, over smaller representations then we say that d of g is reducible and for this purpose one has to introduce the concept of the direct sum of a of vector spaces
then you have uh, the notion that if you have uh, if you have two uh, two if if you have a representation which cannot be written in this way. So if this this condition is not true, we say that. D of G is irreducible and it's often abbreviated as an irrep. Irrep means irreducible representation. Uh, then we have uh, Schur's lemma. And Schur's lemma implies that all, all irrepre irreducible representations of an abelian group are one dimensional. So this is not the statement of Schur's lemma. This is an implication of Schur's lemma that all irreducible re representations of a abelian group are one dimensional basically says that if you have an abelian group uh, it doesn't have matrix representation and that is already captured intuitively by the fact um, that for an abelian group all the elements commute so if all the elements commute then you can't be talking about matrices i think good you know follows from that. Then you have the orthogonality theorems. There are two theorems at the level of the group elements, which is the main one, and then at the level of the characters, which can be uh, derived uh, from the first one. Okay, and then you have the concept of um, direct products of of representations. So this means that if you have two different representations, let's say D one G and D two G of a group. You can take the tensor product to give you another third representation. But in general, these are, these will give you reducible rep representations. So as an example, for instance, the example that I illustrated earlier, if you take two spin one half particles, uh, you can take the tensor product of the two representations and the result will be can be written in this way as the direct sum of a, a spin zero representation and a spin one representation and then finally uh, we had the idea concept of a regular representation uh, which basically gives you uh, these permutation matrices and more importantly, the regular representation contains all the irreducible representations. Okay, okay. so I guess, I guess that that is a fair amount of material uh, but uh, group theory is a very, it's very beautiful, uh, but I, it's understandable if uh, many of you may find it uh, too abstract or not very applicable to whatever it is that you plan to do in physics. But that can be, the same can be said of almost any of the topics in mathematical methods.
Okay, any questions at this point? All right, so now I'm going to talk about and some applications. What are uh, these, uh, what is all this, all this technology, this group technology, what, are, what is it good for, okay? So as an example, we'll consider the vibrations or the vibrational spectrum of a triatomic molecule, okay? So in other words, we have We have three atoms, right? And uh, they form a molecule and we can, let's say, label them, label the three vertices as A, B, and C. And we'll uh, also assume that this is an equilateral that the side lengths are all the same. So it, it's an equilateral triangle, right? So one of the things that we know immediately is that the, what are the symmetries of, the, of, this, of this shape? The symmetries of the shape are given by D3, which is the dihedral group, uh, which is the group of, uh, discrete symmetries of a triangle, right? Now, what we are interested in, we are interested in finding, we are interested in understanding something about the vibrational spectrum, right? So what do we mean by the vibrational spectrum of anything? So if you have a set of, of N particles, let's say, okay, and each particle, uh, has some uh, position vector. So if you're talking about the vibrations of this molecule, and we are going to talk about the vibrations of this molecule in, in a plane, okay, this is important. So in 2D. So in that case, this vector would be two dimensional, right? <clears throat> so how do you describe the motion of, a, of, a, of some set of particles? You, you describe it using, using Newton's laws, right? At least at the classical level. So Newton's laws, what do they say? Well, they say that if I have the some, some particle whose position is given by X of I, and there is some force acting on that particle at location I, then the second derivative of this position times the mass is equal to that force, right? This is Newton's law. Now, and in many cases, this, this force can be written as the gradient of uh, some potential function uh, with respect to this coordinate. But the potential function itself is a function of all the particles, not just of one. Okay. Um, so, 
in this example, so for instance, you know, if you consider uh, if you consider two particles for simplicity, right? Um, what would be what would be the form of this potential, right? And we'll consider two particles in one dimension again to make it even more more simple. So this potential can have different forms. It can look like this, for instance, one half k one x square, one half k two x two square, right? These uh, these forms are. I'm sure you know all of the or all of you know that this is what the potential energy of a of a harmonic oscillator looks like, right? One half k x squared. But then there can also be some interaction term between the two two particles, right? So we'll write that as let's say one half k three x one x two, right? So this is an interaction term, but we won't take terms which contain higher powers of x1 and x2 right so at most this is quadratic in the coordinates so this kind of a of a, of a of a function it can be written in the following form you can write it as follows uh, we can take the uh the vec these position and write them as components of a vector okay and then we can write a matrix whose diagonal elements are one half k1 and one half k2 and suppose i'll remove this half over here and which has some off diagonal element which is equal to one half k3 and then times x1 x2 so i can write this as so i'll write it as capital x which is a vector transpose multiplied by the matrix k times vector capital x so this is this is our potential function it is a quadratic function of the coordinates okay so this is for two particles but i can write the same thing for n particles for n particles in one dimension let's say it would be the same form okay but what if i have for n particles in two dimensions how would i write that so now you have how many coordinates you have 2 to the 2 to the n coordinates right because you have the x coordinate and the y coordinate right so you have x1 y1 all the way till xn yn you have 2 to the n coordinates right but what we can do is we can again make a single vector i'll write it as an as a as a transpose just to save space and i can write this all the elements all the position components as elements of this vector and so this becomes a two n dimensional vector and let me make some more space
So I can write this as a two n dimensional vector. And once again, I can write my potential function in the following form. I can write it as this position vector times some matrix K times uh, the position vector. Again, so it is of the same form. Now, one thing you will notice is that I've, I've collected all the components, the X, the X components and the Y components, and I put them all within the same vector, right? And uh, now you might ask, well, why do I do that? Why not write instead all the X components as in one vector and all the Y components in another vector? And then express the potential as some function of the of the x coordinates. So I'll put a k1 over here. And uh, and a similar function for the y coordinates. Why why do I not do this? Well, the reason is because there can be a coupling between oscillations in the x, x components along the x direction, oscillations in the x directions, and those in the y direction. Okay, so um, as an example, you can consider, you can consider this example that, that I've just given you, which is a triatomic molecule, right? And we can uh, express, we can, we can imagine that each of the atoms is connected to each of the other atoms by a spring, which has a spring constant small k, small k. Okay. This is the spring constant, and it's the same for all three, for all three springs, and so the equilibrium configuration will consist of will be when uh, the particle is all of the three particles form a equilateral triangle, right? When all the distances are the same. That will be the equilibrium configuration for such. Okay. So now for this system, uh, we will write down what uh, the equation of motion is, which uh, as I mentioned earlier, is just this Newton's second law. Okay. But let me write that again. And so now I will write this as m of x i double dot, right? So I have this big vector capital X, which contains all the coordinates. In this case, how many coordinates are there? There are six of them, right? X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. So for each one of those coordinates individually, we have Newton's second law, and this can be written as uh, the derivative of the potential function with respect to the ith component of this coordinate vector. 
and this this potential now as i as i explained has the form has this quadratic form okay so if i write this down in matrix if i expand the components if i write down the indices explicitly i can write it like this right x j k i j x i sum of i of j from 1 to n right so this is this is our potential function now what happens when i take the gradient of this potential with respect to the i coordinate you will get a uh, you will get this expression k i j x j right so you can just take this expression and take the derivative with respect to the i component and you will be left with this what is this this is basically the matrix k multiplied by the by the vector x and so our equations of motion are given as can be written in this way so again let me i'll just use the vector notation m of x double dot is equal to minus matrix k times vector x okay so this is our equation of motion for n particles which are coupled to each other in a at most a quadratic coupling okay so this applies to any any set of n particles in any number of dimensions at 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 this stage okay but now we 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 specialize to the case of a equilateral triangle now how do we solve this kind of a of a of a system right what do we what do we normally say we say that okay well let me assume uh, that all of the position all of the elements of this uh, of this position vector will will perform small oscillations around the equilibrium position so that means your position vector as a function of time can be written in the following way some equilibrium configuration x not times some oscillation factor cosine omega t plus phi not phi not is some phase angle omega is the oscillation angular frequency right now one might ask well why uh why do i have a single omega for all the coordinates well again um that doesn't have to be the case but so you can have configurations where the different particles are vibrating at different rates different frequencies but all such configurations can be expressed in terms of superpositions or linear combinations of these solutions right so these are the eigen states or the eigen modes of the system so what will be the solution if i just plug this back into my my expression for newton second law i get m i get minus m omega squared right so the second time derivative the second time derivative will give me minus omega square times cosine so a minus m omega square x not then cosine omega t plus phi or phi not is equal to minus k minus 
minus k uh, so, right minus k x naught times cosine omega t plus right now the cosine term on both sides cancels out and so we are left with this following expression which i will as m omega squared x okay now what is this so this is our what sort of is this can somebody tell me vishnu what sort of an equation is this what do i call this equation eigen value k so this is an eigen value equation right and the matrix whose eigen values we are finding is this is this k matrix and the eigen values are of the of this form m omega square okay so this implies that these equilibrium configurations are eigen eigen vectors of this k matrix with some eigen value m omega square now what does all of this have to do with hydrogen symmetry of the system because that's what that's the reason that um that's the reason that we are discussing this problem well i'm discussing this problem and you all are sitting there pretending to be interested in it <laughs> so the symmetry of the problem should come into the picture at, at some point right and this is the stage at which the symmetry comes into the picture so the reasoning is as follows what if you have some symmetry right so what is the symmetry of the system okay and it has to be a symmetry of it has to be a symmetry of the dynamics not just of the kinematics that means what is the kinematics the kinematics is simply the equilibrium configuration so it and what is the dynamics the dynamics is the equation of motion right so this is the this is the dynamics so the symmetry in question should be we would like it to be a symmetry of the dynamics but what what but in the first place what is the expression for a symmetry well again we'll say that there is some group this group g and this group acts on our system in some way right so when we say that it acts on the system what is the system the system is specified by uh this vector x right or x of t this is our system well you can also have x dot of t the velocities or the momenta but for the time being we'll just consider something which because uh, the velocities don't matter in this case because uh, we are talking about a potential function which only depends on the displacement okay so the group g acts on the system and the system is given by these vectors x right and 
so what is this x it's a it's a n times d dimensional vector right n particles moving around in in d space dimension so if you have uh for 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 three particles in 2d what is the dimension of this vector it's 6 right so the group this group acts on this six dimensional vector right so this means that what will be the action of the group so dg is some group representation matrix right which acts on okay well i'm i'll wrap up which acts on this vector x so this group g this matrix g has to be a 6 by 6 dimensional matrix which implies that d of g is a 6 dimensional representation of the group g and i'll stop here for today and in our next class we will see uh what this tells us about the spectrum of the solution so in this case our group g is uh the dihedral group and what we are looking for looking for is a six dimensional representation of the dihedral group and this group this representation will be will be reducible it has to be reducible right because we saw that the uh, that d3 has only three irreducible representations and the highest dimension is 2 so a six dimensional representation has to be built up from the smaller representations and it has to be a reducible representation okay all right then i will see you all in the next class okay bye bye